Good afternoon, everyone, <laughs> and welcome to today's Power of Diversity lecture featuring our own Carrie November. Uh, the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusive Engagement sponsors the Power of Diversity Lecture Series. Uh, and the purpose of our series is to inspire campus dialogue, community engagement, and civic education and learning uh, about the national narrative on diversity and inclusion. Uh, and we're really excited to have an opportunity to share space and hear from our own Carrie November today. Um, uh, next month will be our, our last lecture for uh, the series for the fall, uh, which will uh, fe feature a lecture from Dr. John Bickers. Uh, he will be uh, talking uh, from the subject of from subjects to scholars, indigenous peoples and the academy. And this, uh, as I said before, will be our last lecture for uh, the particular uh, semester. Now, we will launch our spring lecture series uh, during Black History Month with uh, Spencer Paysinger. Now, he is a Super Bowl champion uh, linebacker who turned uh, Hollywood writer and producer. Spencer Paysinger brought his own poignant story uh, of living in South Central Los Angeles uh, and playing football at Beverly Hills High School uh, uh, to the hit CW and Netflix series All-American. And so it will continue to be an exciting time. If you missed any of our lectures uh, and you'd like to catch them, uh, you can go to our webpage and review the lectures and other events that we have. So we encourage you to do so, uh, to go to our webpage and to go to campus groups if there's anything that you may have missed. Uh, also, we want to remind you that at the conclusion uh, of today's presentation and lecture, there will be an opportunity for questions. Uh, so please be ready to ask questions and engage uh, in a robust discussion. Uh, I won't labor here long, and I'm going to turn uh, the podium over to Sophia Hall uh, from Hear From You, uh, who will share information about uh, the organization. And then after Sophia, we will hear from Jada Oliver uh, from our ASL club, who will be introducing Carrie November at that time. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, and we know that you will enjoy our lecture. Hello, um, I'm Sophia Hall. Uh, thank you, Vice President Solomon. Um, and before I start, I wanna thank Professor November for inviting me to speak here today. Um, so I'm one of the co-founders of Here For You, um, alongside Trinity Goodlow. Um, and I am hard of hearing and I wear a hearing aid. Um, and I'm a third year communication science major who's aspiring to be a future audiologist. Um, so Here For You is a new deaf and hard of hearing club on campus. And we're trying to raise awareness um, about the community, that are those that are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, and many times students like myself will come to case from a high school in which I was the only person in my class that not had hearing loss, but had uh, or used hearing aids and assistive technology. Um, and so it was very isolating. And even back then, I reached out to the one Instagram account I found that said they connected other teens with hearing loss. And I never got a response from them. Uh, but now I'm here at Case, um, and I've met other students with hearing loss. I've had the chance to chat with three other deaf or hard of hearing students. Um, and each time I do, I feel really understood. We share our common struggles and our frustrations, um, but we really understand like our successes and our excitement as well. We've shared our struggle with captions and how they're not necessarily accessible um, everywhere on campus. Um, and we share tips with each other. Uh, like one time, one of our fellow, uh, he had graduated a year past, um, but he mentioned Otter AI. And for those that don't know, Otter AI is a live transcriptioning service, but it can also record like what the speaker says. You can go back and listen to it um, and how helpful he found that. And one celebration I was fortunate enough to be able to share and I felt uh, was really understood uh, was that by some miracle uh, this summer, I was gifted a new hearing aid. Um, and for those that don't know, hearing aids are rather expensive. Um, and so I was able to share with people that really understood how important and helpful this technology was. Um, 
So we want to bring access and community for those that have similar experiences uh, here at CASE. That's the primary reason that Here For You has come about. Uh, part of the club is an affinity group for those that are deaf and hard of hearing. Um, and another part of this club, which is currently an aspiration, uh, is that we want to connect with the local Cleveland middle and high schools to connect them with mentors and other students that are deaf and hard of hearing, uh, which is something I really wish I had when I was growing up. Another aim for Here For You is to educate about hearing loss, uh, hearing health, and how hearing loss can affect those around you. As we've gained interest in the club here at CASE, we've been asked to present on best communication methods um, and how hearing loss affects even us as students. Hearing loss affects everyone differently. Everyone has a different experience within the deaf and hard of hearing community, so we really want to be able to share multiple viewpoints and multiple experiences. I'd like to emphasize that Here For You can be for anybody, um, those that are deaf and hard of hearing, but also hearing alike, um, because education is really important and those that are hearing can also advocate for accessibility. And so hearing peers can help bring about accessibility on campus. And we've had interest in conversations with other students that have cousins, fathers, or even siblings. Accessibility is a passion and a driving force of this club, um, but accessibility measures are often overlooked unless people are educated about why these accommodations are really necessary and important. This summer, through my internship at Huff Ear Institute in Oklahoma, uh, I was able to give a presentation and start an initiative to uh, educate about hearing loss in the classroom and, uh, sorry, and help students, all students, through improved classroom acoustics. So Here For You, I hope, can take a similar approach here on campus um, so that classes can hopefully in the future be mic'd and that captions can become more accessible. And this is helpful for not even just students with hearing loss, but those that might not have English as their first language or those that are neurodivergent. And even sometimes just a classroom is really noisy or a professor is really soft-spoken. So all classrooms would benefit from microphones and captioning systems. We know that our club's goals can seem lofty, but as we build and grow a presence on campus, we really hope that even some of our goals can make an impact here at CASE. And so I'm going to turn it over and a club that has been educating about deaf culture um, and creating a but open space to learn and practice American Sign Language has been the ASL Club. So I am now pleased to introduce Jada Oliver, who's the ASL Club's deaf and hard of hearing representative, to talk to you all a bit more about the ASL Club. Uh, thank you for your time, and thank you again, Professor November, for inviting me. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jada Oliver, and I will be speaking on behalf of Case Western's American Sign Language Club as the deaf and hard of hearing representative. Um, today, I'm delighted to inform you of the mission of our ASL club and the vital role it plays in our promoting our inclusion and understanding on our community. Um, but before I begin, I would like to provide some background on what ASL is um, in case anyone doesn't know. American Sign Language, or ASL, is the officially recognized American form of sign language that is used by individuals with communication disorders across the United States and English-speaking parts of Canada. Uh, contrary to popular belief, ASL is not a universal language, meaning that it is not compatible with use in other countries, as each country has its own form of sign language. Um, it is also important to understand that not everyone who uses ASL is deaf, and not all deaf people use ASL. But ASL is at the heart of deaf culture within the United States. There's one of the power, that's one of the powers of American Sign Language. It bridges barriers for those with communication disorders, and especially in the deaf community, it allows for the fostering of a vibrant and rich community with its own traditions, values, and histories. And that was the goal of our club's president, Aja Leatherwood, when founding the ASL club at this school two years ago, to promote a rich, diver diverse, and inclusive community for everyone on campus, regardless of their hearing or communication abilities. Not only do you not need to be deaf or hard of hearing to join, but you don't have to have any background in ASL to join us in our mission to inclusivity. We offer a platform for individuals 
sorry. <laughs> we offer a platform for individuals to develop their ASL skills, whether they are beginners or advanced learners, as we believe that fluency in ASL enhances communication and empathy towards those with diverse backgrounds and needs. Uh, this platform for continued learning helps us focus on one of our primary objectives of educating our members and the broader campus community about the importance of ASL and deaf culture. Through workshop and presentation focused events, we aim to raise awareness um, about the challenges and triumphs of the deaf community and how ASL can be utilized throughout. Uh, to, our, to achieve our mission of inclusivity, awareness, and skills development, our ASL club engages in various activities and initiatives. Uh, one of the main focuses is on our community outreach. So we organize a lot of workshops and presentations on ASL and deaf culture to engage with the broader community um, in an effort to reduce uh, misconceptions and foster more inclusive society um, by raising awareness. Um, our events range from deaf awareness events where we expose attendees to deaf culture uh, through guest speakers to help them gain a deeper appreciation um, and correct misconceptions and stigmas um, to hands-on experience workshops where we teach basic ASL signs through the guidance of our advisor, Professor Carrie November. Uh, through these events, we hope to break down barriers and encourage people to see ASL as a legitimate and valuable form of communication for so many different people, uh, especially through the personal stories and experiences brought forth by deaf and hard of hearing presenters uh, and group members alike that can humanize the issues and help attendees relate on a personal level. Uh, our American Sign Language Club plays a vital role in promoting inclusion and understanding with our community, um, and this vitality is evident through our club being awarded uh, the Outstanding New Student Organization of the Year Award, um, as well as our President Asia uh, earning the Diversity Excellence Award. Um, ASL is not just a language, it's a gateway to a world of culture, empathy, and connection. By embracing our mission and participating in events, we can all uh, take steps towards a more inclusive and compassionate society where everyone's voice, whether spoken or signed, is heard and valued. One special person who is indispensable to promoting our mission is Professor Carrie November. Professor November is not only the advisor to our American Sign Language Club, but she is also the sole professor for Case Western's American Sign Language courses and one of the few, if not the only, fully culturally deaf people on campus. I had the pleasure of meeting Professor November when I first signed up for her ASL 1 course uh, last fall, and for the moment I first met her, I knew she was going to be my favorite professor. Uh, not only does she captivate the class with her warm smile and bubbly personality, um, she also provides first-hand experience on what being deaf is like and enriches our lives with information not normally talked about. Um, and it was with her class that helped me embrace being hard of hearing and pushed me to join the ASL club where I had the opportunity to meet so many lovely people who are also deaf and hard of hearing who can relate to the struggles um, and provide unwavering support as Sophia previously mentioned. Um, I would like to illustrate some of Professor November's accomplishments. So in 2006, she graduated from New York University, majoring in education, and in 2008, she earned her Master, degree of Art, Master of Arts degree in teaching American Sign Language as a foreign language and curriculum design from Columbia University. Professor November not only acts as an advisor for the ASL club here at Case, but also actively engages with the deaf community by participating in ASL workshops, attending ASL events, and delivering lectures across the United States. Moreover, she is a co-founder of Tremont Brainery, a volunteer effort hosting workshops where neighbors teach neighbors in any of area of that you can imagine. Um, and as you can probably tell, Professor November's personal and professional aspirations revolve around fostering cultural understanding and facilitating communication between hearing and deaf individuals, which is what she is here to do today. And it's with great honor that I would like to introduce the wonderful presenter of today's Power of Diversity lecture, Professor November. Goodness, I'm trying not to cry right now. That was, that was very, very sweet. Thank you. Okay, so I'm 5-1. I had to have a stool <laughs> so that you could see me. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me clearly? Perfect. Thank you for having me here today. And I am truly grateful to Case Weston for providing me with this platform to share my story. I stand before you not just as a speaker, but as a testament to the power of determination, resilience, and the importance of forging one's path when faced with adversity. As a deaf individual, my journey has been marked by challenges, shaped by the profound guidance of audiologists and the complicated but loving relationship with my mother. Although my mother may not have fully understood the best path for me at the time, 
Her choices were made with what she believed was the right decision. It's important to acknowledge the complexity of our relationship when it comes to my deafness. I was born deaf in Whitestone, Queens, and my father had passed away when I was only six years old. I am the first and only deaf person in my family. Radiologists at the time strongly discouraged my mother from allowing me to learn sign language, labeling it as a crutch that would hinder my speech development. As a result, I embarked on a mainstream journey filled with speech therapists, listening practice, and attempts at socialization. Throughout my early school years, my accommodations were limited. I had a student note taker in some classes and received one-to-one -one assistance during elementary and middle school. In high school, the support was limited to just one period a few times a week. At home from the ages of 10 to 17, my accommodations included a TTY, which was considered a text telephone, that's old, that's out of date, and closed captions on the television. The day my mother saved up enough to buy a device that provided closed captions, I was overjoyed. Now I could replace reading books with watching television and still understand the content. My struggles persisted throughout my schooling. I took sign language as a foreign language in high school, but it was insufficient to guarantee fluency. This made it challenging to receive sign language interpreters as an accommodation. Captioning services were denied to me up until my senior year in high school, leaving me with the daunting task of trying to catch up on what I had missed in class after returning home. My struggles persisted throughout my schooling. I, I read that part already, my bad. It wasn't until my sophomore year of high school that I finally had tutors. During my junior year, I made a life-altering decision to receive a cochlear implant with the hope of a more successful academic future. I wanted a cochlear implant to communicate with people without a lot of repetition and to advocate for myself more effectively. This marks the beginning of my journey as a self-advocate. Okay, so this is going to get kind of science so bear with me. I'm about to explain what a cochlear implant is. A cochlear implant is a medical device that restores hearing for individuals with severe to profound hearing loss by bypassing the damaged, oops, by bypassing the damaged cochlea and include the external speech processor. So you can see it's up here, which captures sound and converts them into electrical signals. These signals are then transmitted to the internal component through a transmitter coil, which is up here. The internal receiver and electrode array are surgically implanted behind the ear. The electrode in the cochlea stimulate the auditory nerve, allowing the person to hear sound. Auditory rehabilitation is recommended to improve signal interpretation. Cochlear implants have been helpful for some deaf individuals, but their su success depends on various factors such as age, practice, and regular mapping. Bottom line, it is not a magical cure. The day I went to have my cochlear implant activated, by the way, they used the term turn on, which made me so uncomfortable. And I was like, can you please say activated and not turned on? So I was like, oh. The first sound I heard can best be described as radio static. It was not a pleasant sound. I was told to keep the implant on as much as possible and practice listening to different sounds, such as running water, flushing the toilet, and banging the door. I had to do this to learn how to recognize different sounds. Not only did I have to learn how to listen, but I also grappled with uncertainty about my identity. It was during this time that I realized there were going to be a lot of changes, which was challenging for me. For those of you that know me, I value stability and routine, so that was a challenge. It's crucial to emphasize that, even with a cochlear implant, I still function as a deaf person. I received the cochlear implant later in life, and I still encounter challenges in daily communication. The cochlear implant has been helpful in quiet spaces, one-on-one -on -one situations, but it depends on the person and, um, and in small groups. However, American Sign Language remained invaluable to me. To me, deafness is an identity, not a disability. Yet, when requesting accommodations, I have no choice but to check the disability box, as that's how the government and the medical field categorize us. It's important to remember that all deaf individuals are not the same. 
Some prefer to read lips and speak, while others prefer written or typed communication. Some may express a sign language interpreter. With the cochlear implant in my right ear, I can distinguish about 60% of sound and words with lip reading, but I have no hearing in my left ear. Without the cochlear implant, I am completely deaf, and my lip reading accuracy dropped to around 30%. Many deaf individuals express difficulty in reading lips as it takes time to adapt to each new person's unique way of speaking. Therefore, when meeting a deaf person, it's best to ask about their communication preference and accommodate their request. Additionally, alongside asking about communication preferences, it's essential to inquire about how individuals identify. Some may identify as hard of hearing, typically indicated with a lowercase deaf. Other may not have a specific identity, while some may identify as culturally deaf. Oh great, high school. My junior and senior years of high school were exceptionally challenging. Upon receiving the cochlear implant of 17 years old, at the end of my junior year, I had to dedicate time every week to audio verbal therapy and attend monthly mappings. While managing these adjustments, I also had to focus on college application and studying for the SATs. Can you imagine? For those unfamiliar with the term, Mapping refers to the programming of the cochlear implant. Balancing the demand of adapting to the cochlear implant while navigating college applications and academics took my full attention. Little did I know that this decision would lead to conflicts within the deaf community. I faced disdain and insults during college tours and deaf events, being labeled as, I'm gonna show you this thing, fake healing, or a person who talks too much. Those are insulting signs. Here are a few examples of what I encountered. During a college tour, the disability coordinator herself was deaf, but she was an older deaf woman set in her ways. I had the cochlear implant for about two months and I was still adjusting to it. When I met with the disability coordinator, she sang directly to me, but I struggled to understand her. I was not yet fluent enough in sign language to have a conversation with her. She then asked us to wait while she found a sign language interpreter for the meeting. After the meeting, I requested to meet the deaf student at the college. She hesitated, and then she said she would arrange it only if I agreed to hide my cochlear implant. Can you believe that? And so I basically couldn't mention it. I felt shunned and declined the offer. As a result, of course, I didn't go to that college. These challenging years were marked by a profound identity crisis. I was unsure about what label to use, whether to identify as hard of hearing or deaf. I started my college journey at the University of Vermont, where I initially majored in elementary education with a minor in communication sciences. At that point, I was not sure about my path, and UVM was accommodating, so I showed that college. However, it was during my college years that I earned the acceptance and respect of the deaf community. In college, I retook sign language courses, actively participated in more deaf events, and sought opportunity to communicate in sign language whenever I could. This proactive approach led to the formation of meaningful deaf friendships and the honor of receiving my first sign name. This is a symbol of being embraced and welcomed by the deaf community. Now, only a deaf person can grant a sign name. After about a year and a half, I realized that UVM was not the right fit for me academically, despite the wonderful connections I had made. I needed to find a major that aligned better with my interests and aspirations. So I transferred to NYU. I pursued a dual major in elementary education and special education with a minor in psychology. It was during my time at NYU that my sense of advocacy solidified. I reached out to the disability office with two requests. First, I asked to continue receiving captioning services in my core classes, as I did not feel confident in relying solely on sign language interpreters, especially in certain classes. I also requested a sign language interpreter for two specific classes. My second request was for the disability coordinator to speak with one of my professors who seemed to be taking advantage of my captioning accommodation. This professor 
had been recording his lectures with the intention of publishing them. And when he saw my accommodation, he demanded that I email him all the transcripts. I informed him that I would speak with the disabilities office. And then once I did, they spoke with him and he left me alone. NYU not only helped me grow as an advocate, but also played a pivotal role in shaping my future. My internship at 47, the American Sign Language and English Secondary School, which was a deaf and hearing school, was focused on teaching all subjects through American Sign Language, clarified my passion for teaching sign language. Living in Manhattan provided me with access to numerous resources and deaf events, further strengthening my identity. ASL slam shows where deaf individuals shared poems and sang stories made me feel like I truly belonged again. They have an Instagram, by the way, if you want to follow them. I applied to the Teaching American Sign Language Master's Program at Teachers College, Columbia University. My stepfather played a pivotal role in advocating for my decision to teach sign language as a profession. I will forever be grateful for his support. My educational journey continued as I pursued a graduate degree in teaching sign language as a foreign language and curriculum development. I feel like I'm going to that. Curriculum development. During this time, I formed two strong bonds with a core group of friends who helped me identify. No, that's not what I want to say. I'm just changing the standard. Okay. I formed strong bonds with a core group of friends who helped me define my identity over two and ten years of study and come out of it. It was during this phase that I finally received sign language interpreters in all my classes. This was making a significant shift in how I accessed education. It was also when I confidently identified myself as deaf. In the deaf community, the use of lowercase deaf or uppercase deaf indicates one's identity. If you encounter someone who types lowercase deaf, they may not be part of the deaf community and may not have fully embraced their deaf identity or deaf culture. Those who refer to themselves as hearing impaired typically are not involved with sign language or the deaf community. It's essential to note that the term hearing impaired is offensive and politically incorrect and should never be used. It was not until my time at Teachers College that I wholeheartedly embraced my deaf identity. I started my journey by saying I was hard of hearing, but by the end of it, I partly stated I am deaf. After completing graduate school in 2008, I eagerly applied for teaching positions in sign language. I started with a part-time job and at the time did not fully realize that I had the right to request a sign language interpreter for a job interviews. My first interview was quite stressful with numerous questions that needed to be repeated or rephrased. The principal and chairperson asked me something like, okay, brace yourselves. How can we hire you? You are deaf. And if we have to hire a sign language interpreter every day, why should we hire you? In response, I explained that I was teaching sign language and that there was no need for a sign language interpreter during classes because the students would experience a full immersion approach. I was hired. However, that year turned out to be very challenging. I stepped into a high school sign language program where the previous sign language teacher was not certified. I had two sign language one classes and one combined ASL two and three class. My days became more about behavior management than teaching the actual material. My initial plan for a full emotion approach went out the window, and I quickly realized I needed to revise my teaching approach. A few months in, I was informed that I would have surprise walkthroughs, informal and formal observations. The feedback I received from both the chairperson and the principal were focused on how can you hear the students whispering? Or how do you know if they're using their phones? Ridiculous. They did not address the strategies for motivating students or managing their behavior. It was then I recognized the need to educate the administration and advocate for myself. I explained that after consulting with my colleagues, I learned that students tend to whisper in any classroom, regardless of whether the teacher is hearing or deaf. My colleagues also clarified that they cannot decipher whispers and they are hearing. 
In response to the phone issue, I incorporated a participation grade component that required students to keep their phones out of sight, which helped to some extent. Keep in mind, this is high school. Outside of my academic life, navigating daily life as a deaf individual in Manhattan presented a unique set of challenges. The subway system lacked digital notification, and all announcements were solely verbal. At that point, I was still learning to advocate for myself, understand my rights, and determine when to stand up for them and when to move on. From ordering food in a restaurant to mastering the subway system, life in the city had difficulties. The diverse population meant that many people had accent, making communication complex. In a city perpetually in motion, some would rush past me, seemingly indifferent to my need. Additionally, I encountered instances of discrimination. One of which occurred during an incident involving a police officer at a subway station. You ready? Here's what transpired. I had met up with my younger brother, Blake, in the city. I used a reduced fare metro card for the subway. However, when I swiped it, the light on the other side of the turnstile turned red instead of green, which indicate either insufficient fund or a reduced fare metro card. My brother had walked ahead of me and hadn't seen what had initially happened. Suddenly, I felt a large hand on my shoulder, pulling me back. I spun around bewildered. I did not expect to see a police officer. The officer began yelling at me. I told him I couldn't understand him, and informed him that I was deaf and asked him to please speak slowly. He did not adjust his pace. At the time, he did not have his partner with him. Fortunately, my brother realized I was not with him and came running down the stairs to investigate. He approached us, asked the officer what was going on, and became visibly angry, leading to a confrontation. It was at this moment that the police officer's partner arrived to assess the situation. After my brother explained to the partner what was happening, the partner apologized and removed the officer from our vicinity. I later learned that the officer had accused me of pretending to be deaf because I could speak. Thankfully, the partner was educated and understood that there are different types of deaf individuals. During this time, I ventured into the world of online dating, which proved to be a truly enlightening experience. I created a few... I'm sure some of you are thinking, oh, God. <laughs> I'm just thinking back to all the terrible first dates. Okay. I created a few dating profiles. Since this experience was new to me, with my first dating profile, I didn't think to mention that I was deaf. However, once I started receiving requests for dates, I realized I had to explain to each potential match how I communicate and that I am deaf. Unfortunately, many times they would either ignore my messages or discontinue the conversation. After a few months of this, I updated my profile to explicitly say, state that I am deaf. This change made it easier to go on dates. Meeting people in bars, especially in the hustle and bustle in Manhattan, was extremely challenging. Just consider how hard it can be for hearing people to date in those cities and then imagine the additional hurdles a deaf person faces with dating. Deaf individuals frequently encounter challenges when seeking accommodations at various places, from educational institutions to movie theaters and concert venues. The process of requesting a sign language interpreter can vary from straightforward to quite cumbersome, depending on the specific location or business. To request a sign language interpreter at different places, the process may vary. A good starting point is typically conducting an online search for using keywords like accommodation, accessibility, or disability office. For deaf individuals that do know sign language and prefer it as an accommodation, sign language interpreters are essential for effective communication and access. I'm waving to my husband because this part's all about him. This is him right here. I told him to stand up, but I think he wants to. It was on January 18, 2015, that another significant event unfolded. Andrew November measured me on Facebook to wish me a happy birthday. Andy and I had first met at the age of 13 during summer camp in the Poconos. We were each other's first kiss. Ah. <laughs> During those early years, social media had not yet taken off, and platforms like AOL were just emerging. 
we did not exchange contact information because you're 13, you're not going to think, oh, can I have your mailing address to keep in touch? That's not the first thing that comes to mind. Later in life, we became Facebook friends, but our communication was limited. It wasn't until that fateful day in 2015 when Andy messaged me to wish me a happy birthday and the rest, as they say, is history. One week into our reconnection, I deleted all my dating profiles. The first few years of our relationship were a learning curve. Miscommunication was timing at the beginning, leading to heated discussions. <laughs> the <laughs> dynamic of a deaf and hearing married couple comes with advantages and challenges. Andy took a sign language course when we started dating, and I became her sign language instructor after he completed the course. I had to navigate my role not only as a wife, but as sign language instructor in a new school district, also in Cleveland. Over time, Andy had become adept at interpreting various situations, such as interpreting the specials at a restaurant or helping me understand a new person that we may meet together. We even shared our story with The Cut, a New York magazine, and we were featured in both a podcast and in print. Reconnecting with my husband, Andrew, who works as a disability litigator, helps me understand my rights, how to seek accommodation to different places, and when to decide whether to fight a battle or move on. One notable example of a battle we fought and won together was my request for a sign language interpreter at the Supreme Court. My husband had the honor of being sworn into the Supreme Court. He reached out to the Supreme Court Marshal to request a sign language interpreter for me to attend and support him at the swearing-in ceremony. Initially, the Supreme Court denied the request. I took it upon myself to advocate for about two weeks in email to secure a sign language interpreter for this momentous occasion. After two weeks of persistence, they finally agreed and provided a team of two exceptional sign language certified interpreters. The experience was incredible and I was very grateful for the experience and to have a wonderful team. When I was offered an interview with the Palmer School Districts, I turned to my boyfriend at the time, now my husband, for advice. He explained that I had the right to request a sign language interpreter during the interview, so I proceeded to do so. It was during this experience that I realized how different it would be in Cleveland. Keep in mind, I came from Manhattan. So I, um, so I recognize the need to be more specific and request a qualified or certified sign language interpreter for future situations. The sign language interpreter provided for that interview was not the right fit. They had asked another sign language teacher in the district to interpret for me, which later I learned was unethical. Subsequently, I had a second meeting to discuss safety drills, visual fire alarms, and related matters. For this meeting, I requested a certified sign language interpreter. Unfortunately, the district provided a sign language interpreter who was not certified or qualified, unprofessional, and had only completed two years of coursework. During the interview, I waited for 15 minutes as the interpreter arrived late with wet hair and in clothing that resembled pajamas. To make matters worse, she used numerous gestures to make signs up. I could not follow her interpretation due to these made-up signs. I had to take it upon myself to advocate for my need to stop the meeting and assert she was not accurately interpreting the conversation. The meeting was not rescheduled and in that they sent me handouts on the safety drills. After the meeting, I explained to the district that only qualified or certified sign language interpreters should be hired for such purposes. Following a year-long battle with the district, I finally received certified interpreters the following year. While I worked as a sign language teacher in the Palmer School District during the day, I also taught evening classes at Tri-C and CSU. My ultimate goal was to secure a full-time teaching position at the university level. In 2018, I decided to change jobs and apply to teach at Case Western and the Cleveland Hearing and Space Center. From 2018 to 2020, I taught at the Cleveland Hearing and Space Center. I had only one evening class at Case Western, and I invested a significant amount of time in that course with the hope of eventually establishing a sign language program. 
each time that I taught the sign language course, the request to join my course grew every semester. Students started to request they could join my course as it fills up quickly. At the time, Dr. Dimari noticed the demand grew for sign language and got to work. In his last year at chair, he was able to create a full-time sign language position. I applied and the application process was very thorough. There, were, there was a nationwide search. I was then offered an interview on Zoom. Case Western hired a team of sign language interpreters on their own. I did not have to ask. I interviewed 16 different people, and one of the interpreters that was with me on this journey is Karen, who you see here in this room. <laughs> I was very excited to start my position. It was at the same time that the sign language club was founded and the interest in sign language exploded. My heart was full. How much time do we have? Because I, I was hoping to do a short sign language lesson, the kind of why I practiced talking slowly, but I wanted also to do a sign language lesson. Okay, I have about 10 minutes, I think. Okay. So I'm going to step down from this, and I'm going to do a few sign language uh, signs. Okay. So the alphabet, so that's just none that together. So now I'm going to be voice off. And I have a few students here. So can you raise your hand? Okay, well, I have a lot of students here. <laughs> so if you need help, you can ask any one of them to help you with sign language. Uh, they're all amazing. Okay, so let's get ready. So A, the thumbs up. I know for those of you in the back, it may be hard to see. So A. Awesome. Okay, so Kai is tricky, so you make the number two, but then you put the thumb in between and a spacing out like that. And then M is three fingers over the thumb. And there's two fingers over the thumb. Okay, so do you remember what Kai was? Good. Now put it down. And then that's P. Do you remember what D was? Down for Q. Perfect. And that's applause because not all deaf people can hear this, and this is more fun and visible. And I like to joke, round of applause. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now let's do introduction. So I'm going to sign, hi, my name. And then name, so you make two hand shapes like this. Now you have to use your dominant hand to do the movement. So let's do that again, and I'm going to stop talking. And then you think of by your own names. And now, but I'm seeing everyone signing the names. Awesome. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I can't watch all of this. Okay, so now what I want to do is I'm going to do a short dialogue with a student just to show you what a dialogue looks like. And then I'll come back and teach you a few more signs. So I have a lot of students here. Anyone want to volunteer? Okay, come on up, Lily. By the way, the first time I met Lily in person was the other day. She was in a remote now, so hi, it's nice to see you in person. Okay, <laughs> so let's figure this out. Can you see us? There's another photo in the middle. And we're both sure. Oh, God. Okay, <laughs> okay so let's kind of stand facing them. Thank you, Mitty, for asking what my name is. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> so I'm going to add on what just happened. 
So what I asked her was, what is your name? Sign language mistakes. I can't tell you how many times I've broken glasses at dinner just by signing with friends. Okay. So your name what? So let's do that together. Now remember, you have to put your eyebrows down. And um, I will. Be, I'm very honest and very open. I just started Botox, so I struggle with my eyebrows, so they don't go up or down as much. So let's try this. But remember, put your eyebrows down. If you're like, what is she doing? Your eyebrows go down. <laughs> And your eyebrows go down at the very end. So let's try this again. Perfect. So that WH question, which means you answer with something other than yes or no. If there's a yes or no question, that's slightly different. Who would like to help me with the yes or no question? Uh, okay, come on up. Okay, so a yes or no question, your eyebrows go up at the end. Can you see me? Are my eyebrows up? So you see the difference between a yes, no, and a WH. So WH means who, what, where, when, how, why, which one. American Sign Language has its own set of grammatical rules. So you don't sign in English order. It is not English. So what I just asked was your name what? So it's a conceptual language. You basically sign the topic first, and then the comment follows. So any questions you have you can save that, because I'm sure you have a lot of questions at this point. I don't want to take up too much of the time because I know there's a question and answer session. What else? Mm -hmm. Colors. We can do colors. Colors. So red, blue, green, orange, yellow, black. So it goes across like that. Brown. Now remember, do brown one time because if you do it twice, one of my students, you're welcome to say it out loud. What does it mean if I sign it twice? Did you hear that? She said beer. So if you sign it twice, beer. One time, brown. Gray. Rainbow. I like that one. You can be fun with it, rainbow. <laughs> um, for colors, colors, I don't know if you notice, green, blue, orange, all start with the letter, like O for orange, B for blue, G for green. Oh, thank you. A very important color I forgot, especially with the Barbie movie going around, pink. <laughs> so P, and then this finger touches the left, pink, and then red. Are there any signs that you would like to learn before I wrap up and say my conclusion? Please keep it appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> so, because I know we're colored, we're older, we can talk about these things, but still it's the professional starting to be appropriate. Boy, girl, anything like that? Mother, father? Okay. Mother, father, boy, girl. Yay! Okay, I will wrap up. Feel free to ask if you think of a sign during the question and answer session, that's fine. In conclusion, I am grateful for the opportunity to share my journey with you today. My story underscores the importance of challenging societal perceptions and expectations. And this is regarding individuals with disabilities and the value of finding one's own path. Not many people with disabilities, but, sorry, I I um I just feel very overwhelmed right now because I'm thinking about everything I should talk about and how far I've come and how much I've accomplished and it's hitting me now and I'm trying not to cry so let me start over. In conclusion, I am grateful for the opportunity to share my journey with you today. My story underscores the importance of challenging societal perception and expectations regarding individuals with disabilities and the value of finding one's own path. 
Not many people with disabilities are as fortunate as I am with my kind position at Case Western. It is not the job seekers with disabilities who need to work harder. It is the employers who must work harder to combat ableism and provide resources to students, staff, and faculty as they embark on their academic journeys. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for those of you that came to support me, to my students, my fans, neighbors, colleagues. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs> So, questions? Okay, let me just move this so I can see you. You are so dynamic, animated, verbal. I've heard you talk before about the difference between deaf people who are verbal and those who speak and those who don't. Can you talk about that? schism between verbal people and nonverbal? Sure. So the majority of deaf people that I know are nonverbal. They grew up with sign language. Okay, let me think about this. Okay. The issue is a lot of deaf schools are not great and a lot of deaf people have hearing parents who don't normally have resources to figure out what they need. So as a result, a lot of time will pass for language development and it's usually by five, six, or seven that a school's figured out or something's figured out and by then they struggle to develop a foundation in any language because the critical period has already passed. So for that reason, there's so many deaf people out there that struggle to speak or do not speak. I'm fortunate in the sense that I can speak. The deaf people who are unable to speak, a lot of them have a community of fun that they usually consider family. Not a lot of them have a relationship with their family for that reason. Is there anything else that you wanted me to ask? Okay. all the way in the back. Hey there, so you mentioned living and studying in New York City. What is one thing or a couple of things that restaurants, bars, hotels can do to, to accommodate for the deaf community? Thank you for that question. We are um, proud hotel members. So what I would love every hotel to do is to um, develop the app that Hilton has where you can communicate with the hotel before you arrive. And now that's so helpful for me as a deaf person to be able to measure through the app without having to call on a relay system. Because when I call on a relay system, they always hang up thinking that it's a telemarketer. And it's a frustrating thing I deal with almost every day, and I just have to develop patience. It would be wonderful if more restaurants and venues in New York have something called insurance and video relay service available, because sometimes some deaf people may not always have a phone on them to call from their phone. So if they can use the video relay service at a certain location to be able to make a phone call, that would be very helpful as well. There's so many ideas. It would be very helpful too if a deaf person preferred to write, to have a dry erase marker and a whiteboard on hand so that you can write back and forth instead of fumbling with your phone because I know people don't always like passing their phone back and forth to communicate. So there's all these different strategies that you can work on. You're welcome. I saw him now. Thank you so much. Good. Hi, Rich. Hi. Very nice talk. Um, Thank you. I think it, you know, typical people are puzzled sometimes at the divisions in uh, handicapped com or disabled communities. For example, that 
uh, blind people have um, arguments about whether seeing eye dogs are a good thing. You should be able to get around without one. You kind of touched on some controversy about um, cochlear implants. I was wondering if you could explain a little about the sort of cultural disagreements about that. Sure, thank you, Bruce. So when um, I was in high school, there was a documentary titled The Sound and Theory that came out. Feel free to try and find it. It's been hard for me to find it on streaming. It's still on DVD, so if you somehow can watch a DVD, I encourage you to try and watch it. It discussed the controversy of the cochlear implant, which was that community of their first language is American Sign Language, and they don't speak. They're very proud of it. And they think, well, why should you hear? Why should you change? You can find ways to live life as a deaf person. There's no reason to get a cochlear implant except who you are. And I can understand that that's their perspective because they don't have the resources to get a cochlear implant. They don't have the resources to learn how to speak. So they embrace their identity. For me, I'm in both worlds, and I feel that now the controversy is not as serious because as long as you're willing to sing and you don't speak at that event and you embrace the language and the culture, they will accept you. At the time, the controversy was more focused on, oh, you have a cochlear fan. You're not in our circle. I don't want you here at the deaf event, even if you did sing. So it really changed a lot over the years, thankfully. This movie was a big controversy because it was about a deaf girl, deaf parents, and hearing grandparents. The hearing grandparents wanted to be able to communicate with their grandchild, and the deaf parent did not want the grandchild to get a cochlear implant. The deaf parents thought she's fine, but they were scared because they felt that they were going to lose her, and that she would no longer sing with them. So as long as you keep both words in mind, you can successfully be both the hearing word and the deaf word. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I was um, very inspired by your talk. And um, I, I, I'm so sympathized with you when you said that you have um, some conflict with your mom. Um, younger in life um, because um, I and my mom also have a recent conflict about my religion um, and then uh, uh, I really curious like when did she start to accept what your choice um, about yourself and your identity or or um, if not, then how did you outgrow it? Like, how did you just continue to do what it's you did? Still really bad. It's still going. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, he just reminded me. He sang to me. He said, "She still refuses to say I'm deaf. My daughter has a hearing problem. That's what she keeps saying. And there's always fight every time I come home." We've already been fighting about Thanksgiving. I don't, I try not to be home for too long because no one in my family sings and it's not fair to him to have to interpret for everyone. So I like to limit my time with my family. Visit, hi, bye. What's important is I'm married to a wonderful man that sang to me every day, and this is my life. That's what I focus on. And I have friends around me that learn sang for me, and that's very important. These are my friends here, Jen and Nisha, and they both took sign language classes to learn sign language to communicate with me. Jen has a daughter, her name is Ava, she's deaf, and I'm teaching her signs so that she can communicate with her daughter. Don't make me cry. <laughs> Hi. Hi, David. Hey, I'm lucky enough to be taking some uh, classes at the uh, public library with Carrie. And um, this is the first time I've heard her voice. So my question was... <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> it's lovely. Uh, so uh, the question is, how does a voiced-off class 
differ in in your mind to the student's perception, some of the nuances of teaching voiced off compared to, uh, let's say, a, a regular class where the student teach. I know that I have to concentrate so much harder and I physically feel my eyes coming out of my head trying to catch up. Uh, so what's your impression and what's the advantage and disadvantage? Great question, thank you. So at the high school level, I cannot ever do braces up. There's way too much behavior management, so I can do braces up if I teach the high school level. At the college level, I've never ever used my brace because I know that my student will behave and they will learn quickly. And I, I started teaching college in 2008 in New York. I was always teaching one class here and there and for the entire time I've taught at the college, braces up and full immersion in sign language had always been successful. Think about it, you're paying for school, you're gonna be motivated, you're gonna to wanna to do well. High school, you don't, well, maybe a private high school would be different, but I've never taught a private high school. Hi, Michelle. Hi. <laughs> nice to hear you speak. Um, there is a rising trend for parents to teach their babies or children sign language um, as they're, before they can speak. Um, do you see this as a good thing? Would you encourage continuation of um, using sign language for infants? My sister just had a baby and yeah, just curious about your perspective. <laughs> Absolutely. Babies can communicate through sign language before they can actually speak. So there's something called, when you think about baby babble, they're signing babble. And babies, are, hearing babies, if parents are focused and determined, they can communicate first through sign language before spoken language. So if you want to communicate with your baby right away, why not? Um, continuing on with trends, um, on social media nowadays, there's a big influx of people that are not qualified um, trying to show people ASL and trying to, I don't know, teach. <laughs> yeah, can you explain um, the, the destruction that that can cause um, to wanting to actually learn ASL and how it can impact that? Thank you so much for that question because it is a huge, huge problem. There are a lot of TikTok videos, Instagram videos of people who have not taken a single sign language class who maybe saw someone perform a song in sign language and they decided to take it upon themselves to teach themselves the language because there are online dictionaries where you can learn signs. They may be signing the correct sign, but they're not signing in American Sign Language, they're signing in Sign English. And that completely destroys the integrity of American Sign English. I, I really hope if anyone watching this live stream link, do not teach Sign English. If you have not been certified, if you're not a Sign Language interpreter or not a Sign Language teacher, stop. Hello. It's amazing to hear you speak. Your voice is beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was wondering if there are any resources that could help someone continue their ASL learning career, considering there's only limited classes here at Case. Hopefully we can start signing three here. But other than that, I know my students like, <laughs> hopefully. So other than that, there's um, a great resource called Dr. Bill Bickhouse, so B-I-C-A-R-S, he's deaf himself, and he uploads units of lessons, so if you have patrons to watch his videos, to teach yourself, and then maybe find a deaf person to practice with, make sure they're culturally deaf, make sure that they're familiar with American Sign Language, because not all deaf people remember no American Sign Language. So Dr. Bill, because it's really the best resource that there is out there online and that's free. There's also a lot more free or low cost Zoom classes or different nonprofit 
DAP centers around the country. So you can also sign up for a Zoom class at Gallaudet University or California, wherever you may want to learn because since 2020, sign language has exploded online and especially on Zoom. Apologies, I don't remember the specifics, but I have a vague memory when I was looking into learning to sign that there were two languages and there was some controversy over which was better or more appropriate to use. Okay, so I think you're thinking of the dialects of sign language. So there's sign English, there's Persian sign English, and then there's American sign English. So sign English would be, I'll show you an example. So I, I wait for you to sit. <laughs> okay, so sign English would be, please do not copy me because you can never do this. I am going to the bathroom. So that's for deaf education, basically, to try and help deaf students learn how to speak. So you can see that's the first problem. That's why so many deaf students do not have a solid foundation in the language because they're not learning American Sign Language and they're not learning English. They're learning both together and it's not a language. And then Persian Sign English, you just drop all the conjunctions. So you just say, I go bathroom. And Persian Sign English is becoming more and more common now. So the American Sign Language is slowly evolving and becoming more informal, more casual, it's not as formal as it used to be. So if I had to guess, it's becoming more Persian signed English in a sense as time goes on. Should I do a dance? <laughs> yeah, I'm just making sure that I didn't go over time, okay. Yes, Vice President Solomon. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor November. You've been outstanding, and we're so thankful for you sharing your wisdom with us. Um, you had mentioned the, the term uh, culturally deaf a few times. Could you uh, expand on what that means for us? Sure. So culturally deaf usually starts with, there's so many different ways you can start. For me, I became culturally deaf once I immersed myself in deaf events and I started hanging out with my deaf friends. And I would say every month I keep in touch with my deaf friends and I teach sign language and I'm very involved in the community. I do a lot of volunteer work with the deaf community as well. We do a lot of volunteer work together. So I would say my husband, is culturally involved. He is in the deaf community, but obviously not culturally deaf because he is hearing. But a hearing person can be involved in the deaf community and be culturally a part of that sign language journey in a sense, because the deaf community respects him. He signs with people in the deaf community. If you do not attend deaf events, if you do not sign, and you've only taken a few classes and you don't keep up with deaf events or the deaf community, and your whole circle is only hearing people in no sign language, then you are not culturally deaf at all. I have two questions. Uh, just more so speaking on what you just said, I am hard of hearing, but I also use a lot of pigeon sign. Um, when you say immersing yourself into the deaf community to be culturally deaf or to, to be to identify as culturally, you know, a part of the community, I have found that because I am hard of hearing, I am speaking, but I also sign more traditional ASL as well as pigeon sign. But in my family and household, we also use BASL. Um, I have found that there is a lot of gatekeeping within that community to where we are not welcome. How do you suppose or how do you propose that it becomes more inclusive for people like myself? So that's something I'm currently working on now. Aja, who is the president of the Sign Language Club, 
she's um, going to try and have a BASL topic in the spring so that we can focus on BSL. And I would like to do a collaboration with Cleveland State University's Sign Language Club because their advisor is black and she utilizes BSL a lot. So I would like to try and figure out a way that we can do some collaboration to address that problem. Hello. Um, to provide some context to the rest of the audience, I'm a hearing person who has taken two of Professor November's classes. Uh, my question is, as a hearing person trying to best communicate with the deaf community, having the knowledge I have and lacking the knowledge I lack, is it better for me to communicate using a cell phone or a dry erase board or using the signs I know, probably not in the correct grammar of American Sign Language? And I'm interested in learning more about your experience with your friends who have learned sign language for you, given the fact that it takes so many years to become proficient in a language. What's that like communicating with someone who's trying their best, but maybe not as knowledgeable as they would like to be? One of my friends was very and I'm like, stop it. <laughs> so basically, when you meet a deaf person for the first time, if you hear them speak and you think they're deaf, don't say to them, oh, do you know sign language? Because it may offend them and they may think, oh, wow, I sound deaf. They're asking me this question because that's how I feel sometimes. I would say if they say to you, I'm deaf, I didn't understand you, then at that point ask them, how would you like me to communicate? Do you want me to try and sign? Do you want me to type on the phone? Do you want me to write? What would you like? And you can start talking slower. And then at that point, they will tell you how they prefer to communicate. So you, men you mentioned volunteering within the deaf community, and I'm assuming that would be around Cleveland. Do you have any recommendations for other students such as myself and the other ones of your students here to also get involved outside of the case, the limited case involvement that there is with the deaf community outside of that, if there is anything that we could do to volunteer as well? Yes, thank you for asking. If you would like you can join a literature which sent out every single deaf event that's happening around Ohio. I can give you her name and her email. She handles, her name Kim Bass. She handles all of that. So anytime I see a new deaf event or I see a volunteer opportunity, I will pass it on to her and I will ask her to spread it to all of Ohio in case she hadn't sent it out yet. So that's really the best resource because the deaf community in Cleveland is so small. Oftentimes, people have to venture out to other areas of Ohio to go to different deaf events. And occasionally, the Cleveland Hearing and Speech Center will have deaf events as well. Hi, Ali. Um, hi. <laughs> um, I was curious about what kind of suggestions on like advice you have for situations where people are masked. So like during COVID or in hospitals, um, when like lip reading is like very, very, very limited. Um, and in, in between people who sign and don't sign and yeah, situations like that. So anytime I request a sign language interpreter at the Cleveland Clinic, before when there was still a strong max policy. Oh, sorry if I should try to get my attention. When there was a strong max policy, they, um, I remember this, the doctors and the interpreters all had solid max. And that was very disconcerting for me because I'm used to seeing the entire face. So with max, it's very difficult for me to focus on the measures because I don't see the entire face. So I asked, for them to bring in clear maps with them when they interpret. Even though they're not speaking, I feel that I have full access when I can see their entire face with clear maps. I've noticed that shields are not as safe, so clear maps are very important in situations like that. So always have them on hand in case you need to wear it. 
I know masks have kind of gone away, but people are still utilizing them. So I encourage you if you think you may be in a situation where a deaf person is going to be there, you have to wear a mask, buy a clear mask. You can use soap to wash it before you wear it so that, and wait for it to dry for maybe 10 minutes so that when you put it on, it doesn't bag up. If you have any more questions after this, you can email me anytime. I'll answer whatever questions you have. Let's thank yeah. Professor November for an outstanding presentation. Uh, and uh, certainly there might be those who would like to, to talk to her and uh, a little bit more personally and learn more about her journey. Uh, and thank you all so much for coming out and uh, supporting this event and learning more about uh, inclusive culture on our campus. So there's still some food left for those that didn't get anything. Uh, feel free to partake and uh, thank you again for coming. Thank you so much.